All right. Amen. So we're in chapter number two already. Uh, so last week we took a, a look at how the Amalekite lied to David and tried to get some glory and tried to uh, basically say, hey, you know, I, I did Saul a favor and I put him out of his misery. And we talked about how David, you know, didn't really seem like he believed it, but he kind of, I guess he kind of went along with it. And uh, he's lamenting over Saul's death, even though Saul tried to kill him. You know, he doesn't hold it against him. He actually pays respect to him. He's sad about it. He's not happy about that at all. That's not how he envisioned originally that he would gain the kingdom by someone else dying. And that's a, a great attitude to have there. You know, somebody obviously after God's own heart. That definitely proves that point there. So we'll go ahead and start this off here because there's a lot of stuff to go over in this chapter. So we need to start it off right away. So look at verse 1. It says, And it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And he said, Unto Hebron. So David went up thither and his two wives also, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the Baal's wife, the Carmelite. Verse 3, And his men that were with him did David bring up, every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. And I guess, you know, just right off the bat, you know, the first thing that I see here is his willingness to inquire of the Lord, to get counsel, to figure out what the next step is to do. And so often, you know, we just get caught up in to the cycle of life, you know, we kind of can forget to do that sometimes. But here, you know, David's been through a lot and he takes the time to make sure and get the right answer. And I think it's interesting. Why does God tell David to go up to Hebron? What is the big deal about Hebron? Turn to Joshua chapter uh, number three. I'm sorry, Joshua chapter number 10. Joshua chapter number 10. So the first time you see uh, Hebron, well, yeah, in, in the Bible, I guess it would be Genesis chapter number 13. So if you remember where Lot and Abraham, their herdsmen, they have beef with each other. And, you know, <laughs> Abraham's like, well, hey, look, you know, it doesn't have to be like this. And Lot's like, no, this land's not big enough for all of us. You know, <laughs> it's not big enough for the both of us. We need to do something about this. You know, Abram, being a, a good, mature man, he just says, hey, you know, whichever way you want to go, you know, take your lot, take your pick. And, of course, we know the decision that Lot makes. Well, after this, God tells Abram to lift up his eyes and to look at, he says to look northward, to look eastward, to look westward, to look southward. He says, all of this will I give into your seed. All this land is going to be yours. And so what Abram does is he basically comes to Hebron, which in times past in that time was called kirjath Jerem. I think I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, kirjath Jerem. And so we can see that that is where Abram was in Genesis 13. That's the first time you're going to see that in the Bible. And the next time, um, you see it a couple more times, but I want to show you what happened. So keep in mind, Abram's there. He's building an altar to the Lord. Things are going well. There's probably peace there. You know, it's, it's got, you know, the beginning of the nation of Israel there, right? So why wouldn't things be going well there? But then the next time we see this here is after the Red Sea, after Moses has died, and the children of Israel are beginning to conquer and to gain the land that God had promised Abram that he would give to his seed and to this nation. But look down at verse number three, Joshua 10, look at verse number three. And so you're going to see that um, Hebron basically is now part of this like five confederation <laughs> kingdom of the Amorites. Look what it says in verse three. It says, wherefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoham, king of Hebron, and unto Piram, king of Jeremoth, and unto Japhia, king of Lachish, and unto Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Right? So you can see that there, that now that God's people are no longer there, what's happened? An infestation of Amorites, people who are not good, people who do not serve the Lord. Now go over to chapter number 14, and you can see after the battles, and you know we've read and we've done some studies on, on these battles here uh, in the past, but look what happens next. J uh, Joshua 14, look at verse 13. It says this, And Joshua blessed him, that is Caleb, and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. So now this land here, Hebron, is back into the possession of Israel, if you will. And so that's kind of a, just a, a brief overview history, and I'm going to explain what that means here in a minute, of Hebron. And keep in mind as we're reading 2 Samuel chapter number 2, Jerusalem is not in the picture, okay? Jerusalem is not the capital of Israel yet. It has not been taken over. The Jebusites remain in control of that. Um, and so you say, well, why did God pick Hebron? I believe because it was a strategical move. 
because what's going to happen several chapters from now is you're going to see that David is going to lead his men. He's going to become the king of all Israel, and they're going to basically beat down the Jebusites, and they're going to take possession of that, make Jerusalem the capital. And if you look at the maps, and I don't have a map, and I don't have time to get into it, but it is strategically located. So now that David is moving everybody from Ziklag to Hebron, it's going to be much easier as his sons, as, his, as their families multiply, grow. They get more people unto them. It's going to be easier to relocate all of that influence and all that power power to Jerusalem. Okay, So that's why I believe that God told him to go to Hebron. Now you say, okay, well, great. What does this mean for us? Well, if you remember when Abraham was there in Hebron, things were well. What happens when God's people leave? The infestation comes in, right? They have to fight, beat these guys down, take this land back. And so the way I see it, um, you can go back to 2 Samuel, is that when God's people leave an area, that's what happened. False doctrine comes in, false religion comes in, um, all sorts of problems come in. You know, you think about it, at some point in Treasure Valley's past, um, most churches basically started to neglect preaching the truth. They started to say, you know what, it's not really profitable for me anymore to start preaching on these tough subjects. They got slack, they got complacent. Right? And what happened? Well, the Sodomites started coming in. They started yep. taking over the city councils. They started getting on boards. They started getting into politics. They started taking over HOAs. They started doing everything that they could to bring their influence in sure. because they realized nobody's going to stand you know, against us. Yep. You know, Idaho's going to go the same way as California. That's the mentality that they have. Right. And so what I say is, you know, we need to change that or at least become a huge thorn in their side. So my goal is to be that thorn in their side for this area. They need the look, these queers downtown with all their pedophile flags hanging up. You know, who was telling me that? Right. You tell me that they, they got the pink one. Right. Yep. And it, is, is that the, the 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 map flag, the minor attractive person's flag? Is that is that what it is? It might as well be. They're all fags. They're all right. pedophiles. Right. You know, we need them in the right time to know that there is an organization in Boise, they don't like you. Amen. <laughs> We're not going to do anything physical unless you come in here and you want to try to harm our people, then, you know, something's going to happen to you. But they need to know that there are people that are opposed to you, that don't right. like you, Amen. right? We need to make sure that we become that line in the sand. And I believe in the coming, you know, weeks, months, and years of us just being out in the community, preaching the gospel, getting people saved, and trying to edify these people, teach them doctrine, that they're going to know. You know, we need to slap those QR stickers, and I was talking about this earlier, all over downtown. Yeah, we need to let these people know, hey, we're just not all okay with this. Right. You know, I think sodomy was illegal in this state until 2003. And I think I've told some of you guys this story before. Uh, Dylan was telling me uh, that uh, he'd talked to police officers here who had arrested people for that in, like, the early 2000s. And I remember thinking, like, man, that'd be cool to actually talk to somebody. Well, I did. I met a police officer, uh, he, I, don't, I don't want to say too much about him, I don't want to get in trouble, but um, he has told me that he has arrested people for that crime as late as 2002, you know, you know, that they were doing that. But you know what? Because of the pulpits in this state, because they got soft, because they decided they would rather line their pockets, they would rather please people, they'd rather watch TV and just get saturated with a coming culture that Hollywood and these people want to bring, you know what happens? sodomite infestation yeah, yep, right. we're going to lose the land that's what happens when the people that have the power that have the influence that have the truth back off yep. all of a sudden the amorites come in you know and they start bringing in the pedophiles with them and all these queers and all this stuff happens and there's a reason why they have strategically picked boise right so david right what does he do he asks god like which of the cities of judah should i go to right god says hebron well they asked their god the devil <laughs> which part of idaho should we go to to basically take over well the capital yep. of course right the capital and i was noticing this, this yesterday when we uh we're, we're driving up to david and kara's wedding i saw a big van on the side of the road you know biden sucks and this guy's like selling did you guys see that <laughs> these guys are selling these flags and i'm looking around at these subdivisions and you know it, they got the blue lives, you know, matter flag and, and stuff, you know, it's very, the culture is very different, like yeah. 10 minutes in either direction. It seems like as soon as you just get out of this area, right? But you know, we kind of need to keep it like that. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to go marching in these, you know, military supporting type parades. I don't support the military. It's, you know, they think they're woke, right? But they're nothing but a joke. Right, However, those are the types of people that I believe still can have hope. You know, if we could just radicalize them, like we were talking about earlier, if we could just get them spun up and just tell them, hey, you know, there is a way that we could defeat these people. Yeah. There is a way that we can stop them. Because look, in Idaho, 
I mean, it's not like these other states. Like, like Seattle's done. Yeah. Portland's done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? A lot of these cities in California, they're done. Yep. It, 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 it's, it's done. You just got to go there and scrap. That's what it is. But here, I feel like we could really slow it down. Right. Because there are a lot of just ordinary people in this town that do not like the queers. And right. I talk to them all the time at work. And, you know, we just need to make sure that we're out there and we're not ever afraid to tell people what we believe about that subject. Because as soon as we're quiet, as soon as we go ahead and say, you know what, we don't want any trouble. We don't want any protests. We don't want, you know, to be on the news. You know what's going to happen? We've dropped our swords. We've dropped our weapons. And now all of a sudden they're going to take over and they're going to win. They need to know that there's opposition here. And they're going to know just by our everyday lives. You know, anytime I see a queer with a petition board out in front of a store, like trying to get signatures, right? They always look at like me and my family and they never ask because they, they, you know, they just know, you know, they're just like, they, they don't even know like who we are. They just see a family and, and just because they're satanic, because they're a bunch of fags, you know, they're just like, oh, I don't even want to talk to them, you know, and they don't even know why. I don't want their signature. I don't want anything to do with them. You know, they hate, they hate family. You know, so just seeing a family out in town is enough to get these people set off. Right. But how much more when they see us coming through the neighborhoods with Bibles? Right. That, look, we've experienced, we, that's a weekly battle here. <laughs> they get upset, don't they? They get really upset. And amen, good. If that's all we have to do to piss these people off, then let's do it. Let's let them know, hey, there's a church here that's going to preach the truth. It's going to tell you what the Bible says. Yeah. That, you know what, this whole Pride Month thing is garbage. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and I was looking this up earlier. You guys were talking about it, and I guess it's September 10th and 12th they're going to have their little yeah. pride parade. Now, I wish that hot dog guy was still alive. You know, the guy who used to go down to the parades and throw hot dogs at these people with a coffin, you know. <laughs> I get it. You know, it's frustrating, but that's, that's not wise, right? We, we don't want to go anywhere near that. And so when, wherever they're having their parade on those days, we want to stay away right. because they will molest your minds. Oh, yeah. When these people show up to have a parade, when they show up to protest, I mean, they bring pornographic images with them every single time. Yeah. Every single time. That's, that's what their goal is. That's the, you know, I saw somebody on Facebook the other day that just had like a, a John 316 sticker on the back of their vehicle. And someone slapped a very, I won't even say it, just a very sodomite style type sticker on their vehicle. Horrible. Yeah. That's what they're about. You know, it's like, I wouldn't do that to your vehicle. I don't even want to touch your vehicle. I don't even want to park in the same spot is you after you leave you know if i if i see a, a couple of queers getting a car and i'm looking for a parking space at costco i'm not parking there <laughs> that's just how much i hate them you know what i mean <laughs> so anyways you know the lack of discernment in the pulpit and in churches is why we are in the position that we're in and that's exactly what you see in Hebron. And God wants to bring that influence and that power back to Hebron and strengthen that up. Because what's going to happen, and you've already read the chapter, and if you know the coming chapters, you're going to see that the house of Saul gets weaker and weaker, but the house of David gets stronger and stronger. And we know, okay, well, Jerusalem's going to eventually be the capital. It makes sense that he would send them to Hebron to, to basically prepare the way, if you will. So let's move on here. Let's look at verse number four. And so now we're going to kind of change gears a little bit. And we're going to see this fracture that the kingdom of Israel has. Look at verse 4. It says, And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh-Gilead were they that buried Saul. Verse 5, And David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh-Gilead, and said unto them, Blessed be ye, or blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. And now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you, and I also will requite you this kindness, because ye have done this thing. Therefore now let your hands be strengthened, and be ye valiant, for your master Saul is dead. And also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. Now, keep your place there, but go to the book of Jude. Go to the book of Jude. And we're just going to do a little bit of a review here about Jabesh Gilead. And so we talked about this several weeks ago, how... During that whole Judges 19 fiasco, you guys know the story, right? The tribe of Benjamin, what did they do? They harbored queers. They harbored sodomites. They would not give them up. They would not turn on them. So the tribe of Benjamin had literally become like a tribe of fag hags, right? Fag defenders. <laughs> That's literally what happened. And so this battle ensues. It takes place. God eventually gives Israel the victory, all the other 11 tribes the victory, over the tribe of Benjamin. And they realize, oh, wait. 
This tribe is about to be completely wiped out. What are we going to do? We have these Benjamite women here, and they don't have anybody to marry. They don't have anybody to carry on their name. We're going to wind up losing an entire tribe. And just stop right there for a second and just think about that. God was willing to wipe one of those tribes out, all for harboring sodomites, right. queers, the alphabet people. Yeah. How many Christians today know that? Right. Hardly none. Yeah. Hardly none. Oh, you just like to harp on this. Yeah, because it's a popular topic today. This is Pride Month. I think it's appropriate. It's in the chapter. It's part of what we, we need to understand these things. When you, you just, don't just gloss over this, right? Learn Jabesh Gilead. I know it's not popular, but hey, we can learn a valuable lesson from them, right? And so going back to the story, they say, wait a minute. Okay, so we all swore not to give our wives up to the Benjamites because that's how much they hated what they did. What are we going to do? And then they get this idea They're like, wait a minute. Who didn't come up to battle? Because remember, they called everybody and they said, hey, anybody who does not come up, to support us in this fight against Benjamin needs to be put to death. And they realize, wait a second, Jabesh Gilead, the camp of Jabesh Gilead, they never came up. They're like, this is perfect. So what we'll do is we'll go there, we'll kill every man and every woman who is lame with man and kill their children and try to find some virgins. So they found 400 young virgins, they brought them back. And so they basically became part of the tribe of Benjamin and they were able to rebuild that tribe, which is why it's the smallest amongst the tribes of Israel. And all that to say this again, those that will not stand with us will eventually be destroyed. Because Jabesh Gilead took the side of Benjamin. They're like, you know what? You know, we don't wanna we don't we don't wanna have that attitude against the queers. To each his own. That's the attitude they had. Who cares? No bother you. What they do in the closet is fine. You know, as long as they don't try to push that on me. That's kind of the attitude that they had. But what wound up happening? They wound up becoming destroyed. And that's why I say this all the time. You know, these churches around here, they're looking down on us. Oh, you know, I can't believe you're so old fashioned that you would say that, that you would oppose these people, that you, you know, whatever. They are going to get destroyed because the Bible says that sodomites are implacable. That means they are impossible to placate. You're not gonna be able to placate these people, right? They wanna be accepted. Then it's like, no, we don't want to just be accepted. We want to be married. Now it's like, we want you, we want to be able to force you as a pastor to marry us, yeah. right? It just keeps going on and on and on. Now we want positions in your church. Now we want your money. Now we want your soul, yeah. right? They just won't stop till you're dead. That's why they kill each other all the time because yeah. they're disgusting. They're never pleased and they just consume. And God knows this and says, you know what? These people just need to die. That's why when Abram was like, sure, there's got to be somebody righteous there, right? He wasn't like saying, hey, there's a, some of these queers got to be righteous. He's like, no, there's got to be somebody else like Lot there, somebody else who's saved because he understood the doctrine that if you could be that far gone, you're, you're definitely gone. You're done, right? What does God say? There's nobody there. <laughs> okay. So he blows them out. Same story in Judges 19, right? But they learned from Genesis 19, didn't ask the question. They just said, Lord, what are we going to do? They said, destroy him. <laughs> Kill him. I'm not sending the fire and brimstone. This time I'm going to send you because they have that example. They should know better. Right. This is Israel for crying out loud. They should know how I feel about the subject, yeah, right. especially if you were alive during that time. I mean, Genesis 19 wasn't that long before Judges 19. I, mean, I don't know how many years exactly, but not as long as it is now. Right. And we follow the example. Right? We don't let them in. That's, that's, that's what we do. So again, those that won't stand with us. And that was Jabesh Gilead's problem right? They wouldn't stand for the truth, so they wound up getting destroyed. And that's what's going to happen to all these liberals. They're going to wind up getting destroyed, completely turned over. You know, when the government finally says, you know what, no more, no more church, no more whatever. You know, obviously we're going to still meet. We're going to still do what we do until the last day, but they're going to say, cool, we'll just go ahead and sign up for the state program. We'll get the state funding so we can, you know, just keep driving our Rolex, you know, or not Rolex, Rolls Royce, <laughs> whatever, you know, wearing our Rolexes, something with an R. You know, we just want to be rich. The three R's, Rolls Royce, Rolex, and Rich. That's, that's the goal of most New Evangelicals. <laughs> just, just roll in the R's. That's the sermon title for you, roll in the R's. All right, we got to move on here. Jude verse, uh, Jude verse 7, let's look at this here. So it says this, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So when people ask you, why do you have the stance that you have? Say, because the Bible gives us several instances, and you can name Genesis 19, Judges 19, you know, talk about Asa, Josiah, all these kings in the Bible, that how he feels about that. And the Bible is clear here in Jude, which is towards the end of the Bible, which means the end of the New Testament, because everybody wants to say, oh, it's just love in the New Testament. That's it. It's just love. Just one, one word. Just love. 
what? No, you're a loser. You don't understand the Bible. We have this clear passage that says we were supposed to look at that and sample at that event that God did and say, you know what? We need to figure out a way to apply that to our own lives. So how do we do that? Well, we can't rain fire and brimstone down. We can't take the law into our own hands. We can't resort to physical violence because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're spiritual, right? And so what do we do? Well, okay, we just have nothing to do with them. Because that was the end goal. That was ultimately what happened in Genesis 19. No more sodomites. In Genesis 19, no more sodomites. Okay, so we don't allow them to come into the, the house of the Lord. We don't allow them in here at all. We throw them out. We find people are, you know, siding with them and stuff like that. It's like, hey, you know, we, need, we need to have a talk. You know, there's a disconnect here. You know, what's really going on? And that comes from the Bible. But look at verse number 8. It says, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. And verse 9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now, that's the right attitude to have, but look at what we learn in verse 10. But these, well, who are these? Yeah, these queers, <laughs> these sodomites. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. In those things, they corrupt themselves. And isn't that so true when you knock on one of their doors, right? They're just like, you know, oh, do you know the Bible says this? And it's like, you know, you got that from 101 contradictions in the Bible.com. <laughs> you didn't just open it up and read that. You know, they, they just speak about things they don't understand. All they know is they hate God. They hate what it stands for. And instinctively, because God has written this law on their hearts, they know that it's against them. Right. But they know the root cause. They'll, they'll never tell you this, but they know that they rejected God a long time ago because of maybe something that happened in their lives. Whatever the case is, we don't always know. But they know that it started out with them rejecting God, and now they can't believe, and now they're filled with all unrighteousness. And so that's exactly what we're learning here. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as a brute beast. So every time they open up their mouths, it's evil. Yep. It's filth. It's yep. disgusting. It's, it's like what dogs do. You know, It's what, what, the, what the animal kingdom does. And if you've ever worked amongst these people, especially like your medium to full grown beasts, sodomites, they're filthy. Everything that you say or do, they will turn into a perverse joke yep. every single time, a hundred percent of the time. And you know what? The world just loves it, needs it up because they're taught, oh, you just got to be tolerant. You need to love everybody. And that's just who they are. But no, you don't. You tell them to shut up. Right. That's disgusting, man. Yeah. You are disgusting yeah. right now. Stop talking like that. There's nothing wrong with that. What are they going to do? Fire you? No, nah, not in this day and age. They need people to work. And these yeah. dogs don't like to work. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, verse 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. And so that's what I'm talking about here. These people will eventually perish. Not only them, but the people that support them. They're going to get caught in the crossfire one way or the other. Verse 12, these are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And because these people seek, you know, they're, they're, there's high level devils, like Cruz said, you know, there are high level devils out there that come into these churches and, you know, they want to go soul winning. They want to be part of things all to tear it apart, right. to do damage, to do destruction. But notice what it says here, trees whose fruit withereth. It always seems like when you go back to their converts, they're not saved. Yeah. They didn't really get it. They just, they just didn't because you need to be saved in order to get someone else saved. Yeah. <laughs> right. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. <laughs> and he that wins the souls is wise. Look at verse 13. It says, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. And that's really what it's all about. That's what they do. You know, you get one of these people in the workplace, they open their mouth. It's just shame, shame, shame. It's all just perverseness. That's all they can talk about. That's all they can do. When you run into them in the neighborhoods, it's just the first thing out of their mouth. How do you feel about the LGBTQ AIDS community? That's the first thing out of their mouth almost every single time. It's very rarely where they're like, oh, yeah, I'd like to listen. It's very rare that they do that. So it does happen on occasion, normally with just the dykes. I don't know what it is. There's a, <laughs> the dudes, they're just like, if you can even call them dudes, the soy boys, the, you know, <laughs> these monsters out there, they just get instantly mad. You need to leave. I'll beat you up. But the dykes, sometimes like the newer dykes are like, 
they'll, they'll want to listen. And David had this, you know, and so why can't you get this, right? <laughs> why can't you understand this? So, well, how do you feel about lesbians? Oh, like, oh, you know, okay, there we go. Because you can't always tell. They don't all always have, like, pink hair with, like, the, um, the shackle in their nose, you know. <laughs> you know, their jumper cable that you need to hook up to, to to get them to do some work, right? They don't all come out like that, especially these new ones, you know. They, you know, if they're they're newer to their sect, a lot of times they still look normal, you know, and you got to, like, get the truth out of them and, but that's what it is, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And so there you go. Yep. These people have a reservation, that's right. and it's in hell. Mm -hmm. How dare you say that? You don't know if that queer's going to go to hell. Yeah, I do, because the Bible told me. Right. This is crystal clear. Yeah. I've showed this to people who are not even saved. They're like, yeah. I showed this to a guy in Japan, and he's like, well, my cousin's not going to like that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I guess not, huh? And I was like, guessing he's a queer? I was like, yeah. You know, I've been trying to work on him. I'm like, you're not even saved. That's why I'm talking to you. He's like, well, he's not going to like that. But he understood what that meant. He knows the truth. Verse 14, in Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of thee, saying, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Verse 15, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So here's the deal. Those that won't stand with us against this issue are ungodly. Yeah. I don't care if they go to church five times a week and they give the Malto meal out to the kids over here, you know, or the kids in Africa, you know, uh, they do the ham sandwiches, whatever. I don't care. I don't care if you sent shoes to Zimbabwe. Yeah. I don't care if you give a million dollars a week to your church and you're just the sweetest person in the world. If you stand with the sodomites, you are ungodly. Right. Yep. There's no other way to come out of this book. I'd like to, you know, I might actually do this. I might actually just start calling up churches around here and say, hey, when was the last time you preached out a, a Jude? I'm just, just curious and see what they say. Yeah. How are they going to reckon this with today's culture? They'd have to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's another side of the coin here that we've never seen before. Okay, there's a whole nother thing going on here. This was just for this. Hermeneutically speaking, this was just for Jude's day. Yeah. There was a special type of sodomite back in then they, they just you know they, they, they did go too far but that was then Jesus came and made it so that everybody could say get saved even even Dahmer even Bundy even John Wayne Gacy and the reason why I'm saying this is because this is what I've heard in churches before I've heard pastors say stuff like this and it's not true this is for us yeah. this is so that we don't go down this path and become like Jabesh Gilead right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that is the idea go back to uh, go back to 2 Samuel we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and move on here but I think it's interesting, you know, that Jabesh Gilead got reduced down to 400 virgins, merged with Benjamin, and then they wound up becoming valiant and mighty later on. And they wound up becoming loyal, right? There's a lot of loyalty that I'm seeing here in this chapter. You know, Jabesh Gilead, they did the right thing. You know, they didn't hold it over Saul's head and said, hey, you wasted resources, you mothballed Israel, <laughs> you know, you mothballed us. He didn't bring that to his charge. He just said, let's just go get him because this is not right what they have done to a king. And David, I mean, he's got the perfect opportunity here to go ahead and do some self-promotion, but he doesn't really do that. He just says, hey, I'm, I'm going to take care of you guys. I respect what you did. I've just been made king in Hebron. I'm here if you need me. And that's it. Man, could, could you imagine how much we could do for God if we all had that attitude right. and maintained that attitude in Christianity? <laughs> Especially amongst Baptists. I mean, it would be crazy. But we got to move on here. Look at verse number eight. It says, But Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanim. Verse nine, and made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was four years old when he began to reign over Israel and reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Um, and there's nothing new under the sun, right? So basically, Abner's is kind of the king. Abner's really running the show here. He installs Ishbosheth over Israel. <laughs> He's the one that's calling the shots, telling him what he should do, telling him how to behave, and stuff like that. Um, 
And this is exactly what we see today, right? In case I, everybody in here knows this, I think Joe Biden is a puppet. Yeah. Joe Biden is, but here's the deal. I'd take Ish Boshith any day of the week over Joe Dirty Riding Biden yeah. <laughs> or Kamala Olive Harris, whatever. <laughs> it's okay. These people are puppets, but it's like they can't even find a good puppet today. You know, I mean, Ish Boshith, he's just, you know, Saul's son, you know, just an ordinary guy, kind of weak, but. At least he's not like groping, you know, kids on national TV all the time like Joe Biden is. I mean, that's just crazy to me. Look at verse 12. It says, And Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, Let the young men rise now and play before us. And Joab said, let them arise. So Abner's like, hey, see how good your guys are. Let's go. Let's get the controllers out and just start playing. You know, we're going to play the men. <laughs> Verse 15. Then there arose and went over by number 12 of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 of the servants of David. And they caught every one his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in his fellow's side. So they fell down together. Wherefore, that place is called Helkath Hazurim, which is in Gibeon. And kind of like Pastor Amen has said last week, sometimes Christians fight. Okay? But you know what? There's usually going to be a winner, and there's usually going to be a loser. <laughs> and, you know, this, this here symbolizes all sorts of things. You know, so like in the church setting, right? When people want to fight over petty stuff, stuff that doesn't matter, doubtful disputations, they want to fight, you know, and argue over these types of things, nobody wins. Right? I mean, that's, that's the application. That's like the, the first thing that I see here. Nobody wins. Now, when we fight over things that do matter, we need to make sure that we win. <laughs> we need to make sure that we're right. We need to make sure that we're correct because um, eventually what's going to happen? The battle's going to ensue and who wins? The house of David, right? Because they're right. God's blessing them. God is basically trying to let this nation know, hey, I'm going to ordain David as king. You might as well give up now and just submit yourself to him before it is too late. And so then it starts the battle here. Look at verse 17. And there was a very sore battle that day. And Abner was beaten and the men of Israel before the servants of David. You know, and the reason why God's giving David the victory is because he really is a man after God's own heart. He didn't use the opportunity. He never used the opportunity to degrade Saul. The whole time Saul's trying to kill him, he's just like, hey, you know, someday he's going to perish in battle. And of course it wore him down. Of course it bogged him down. Of course it drove him almost insane. But he maintained his bearing. And at the end of the day, God is rewarding him for that. And I just think that that's crazy. You know, I mean, Saul's dead. He's got the perfect opportunity to be like, hey, he done. Look at all the bad stuff he did and try to like mentally convince Jabesh Gilead and the rest of Israel to follow him. He doesn't do it. He waits for God's timing. He asks for guidance. He asks for direction. And that is so important for today. Before we go into these battles, we need to make sure that we're ready, that we've got our counsel, that we know our scriptures, that we know exactly where we're going so that we can get to the point, like I talked about last Wednesday, and so that God will give us the victory when we fight at the right time. Look at verse 18. And uh, there were three sons of Zeruiah there, Joab and Abishai and Azahel. And Azahel was as light of foot as a wild roe. Verse 19, And Azahel pursued after Abner. And in going, he turned not to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. So Azahel, he's got it in his mind. I mean, he's, got, he's gifted. He's physically gifted. This guy can run. He can move. He's light on his foot. He can cut the angles. He can do all the stuff. But he's fixated on Abner. He's like, you know, I, 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 can, I feel in my being that I can overpower him. I can get him. I can beat him. Verse 20, then Abner looked behind him and said, Art thou Azahel? And he answered, I am. Abner said to him, Turn thee aside to the right hand or to thy left. And lay thee hold one on, I'm sorry, and lay thee hold on one of the young men and take thee his armor. But Azahel would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to Azahel, turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab thy brother? And it's interesting here because I wonder if Azahel was thinking, you know, this guy's and you know, past his prime, he's a little bit older, you know, he's not as fast as me, I'm just gonna keep following him, I'm just gonna beat him down. But Abner's pretty confident. Yeah. You notice that? Abner's pretty confident in what he can do. Mm -hmm. And he actually backs it up. Verse 23, Howbeit he refused to turn aside, wherefore Abner with the hinder 
end of the spear smote him under the fifth rib that the spear came out behind him and he fell down there and he died or and he died in the same place and it came to pass that as many as came to the place where Azahel fell down and died stood still so again you know sometimes experience can be just talent and this is a lesson here that that Israel learned in that day you know just because maybe you're a little bit lighter maybe you're a little bit quicker you know sometimes people with experience they just know they can get you you know and that's like a lesson to our enemies you know we have these like these people that you know every so often they, they want to attack or they want to say things they want to try to test themselves because they've maybe heard a few sermons online or maybe because they listen to Paul Chapel they think they can just roast us you know and you know, we just warn them you know stop you know stop messing with us just just turn around and go away and then finally we get enough and we just smoke them with the Bible you know and it's just right under the fifth rib and you'll see that throughout the Bible under the fifth rib and it's because it's where the um, the heart meets the chest wall and so it's just a good way to basically you know, finish the job, to finish the deal. And actually, I do have a example here. Let's take a look. So, I'll show you this here. So, prop time again. I like these props. Caden let me borrow his spear. This is the same one that Abner had. It was by Sog. And it, it's, it's pretty cool, right? So, the whole time that Azahel's following Joab, Abner's talking to him, what he's really doing, right, is he's taking his broom handle from Mr. Clean and he's getting this thing ready right screws this guy in like this and so as the hell's following him and this is how i think it might have went down i, I don't know exactly you know i'm just i'm just kind of reading along this is just kind of how i read it so abner is going along and he's like hey are you as a hell obviously you can see the guy right and what he does is eventually he gets it off he's just like Dink! he uses that momentum against him and just boom right out the fifth rib now what's interesting when you study this is if you remember back in 1 Samuel chapter 13, it said there was very few, what, sword and spear in the land of Israel. But Abner obviously has the precision and the skill to do that. I mean, just, just, just after the service, you know, if you're of age, you could come up here and just kind of look at this. It would not be easy. You, you might think it's easy, but it's not. I, I don't believe it's easy to actually have that pinpoint accuracy, like right under the fifth rib. You know, so that tells you that these guys trained for battle. Yeah. So that's why I talk so much about training, about following the program, learning the Bible, right? right? Because that's what gives you that confidence. See, um, as a hell, he didn't really have that confidence. I don't think, I think he was relying too much on his natural ability. Whereas Abner, I mean, he's obviously been proven. He's obviously had training because with one shot, he was able to just stick it to as a hell and completely change the way things are going here. And obviously, I'll put this away after the service, <laughs> like immediately after. But um, <laughs> we, don't, we don't want that to fall into the wrong hands here. <laughs> so, you know, this is obviously a devastating blow for the house of David because that is his nephew. Zeruiah is David's sister, and this basically changes the mentality now. You know, I mean, this is going to be a problem for the coming chapters here. But, you know, that's what happens, you know, to us when we think that we're stronger. We think that we're lighter on the feet than we actually are. And we don't have that experience. And we go out there and we take somebody on and we realize, oh, wait a second. That person knew a little bit more than I did. Okay. Now, luckily, you know, in today's day and age, we're not dealing with the Abners with Spears. We're, <laughs> we're using the Bible and Bible verses to do our battle. But you got to give it to him because he had a, he had a zeal. Azael had zeal. It just wasn't according to knowledge. So let's move on here because we got to get this done. Look at verse 24. Joab also and Abishai pursued after Abner. Uh, and the sun went down when they were come to the hill of Amma that lieth before Gia by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. And children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner and became one troop and stood on the top of an hill. Then Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then, ere thou bid the people return from following their brethren? And he's right. He was right to warn Azahel, and he's right here. You know, because you're going to see that later on, Abner dies a fool's death. And David's not happy about it. So again, David is, you know, just, just a very wise person. Why we bring him up all the time in sermons. 
Not only did Saul try to kill him, his own father-in-law, he never held it against him. Well, you're going to see in the coming chapters, when Abner gets killed, what does he do about it? He gets upset. He gets mad. Because Abner was a wise man. He did have some wisdom about him. And David's just getting sick of this internal fighting. But look at verse 27. And Joab said, As God liveth, unless thou hast spoken, surely then in the morning the people had gone up, every one from following his brother. In verse 28, so Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still and pursued after Israel no more, neither fought they any more. But of course, you're going to see that this bitterness is going to stay with Joab, and it's going to become a problem. And I understand. And I think any one of us would, would be better. It would, I mean, it would be a battle. Not all of us are like David. In fact, none of us probably are. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a constant struggle. Look at verse 29. Abner and his men walked all that night through the plain and passed over Jordan and went through all Bithron and they came to Mahanim. And Joab returned from following Abner when he had gathered all the people together. There lacked of David's servants, 19 men and Azahel. And the reason why it reads like that is because Azahel made a name for himself. You know, he was a valiant man. He was a mighty warrior. He, you know, he had a proven track record. Look at verse 31. But the servants of David had smitten of Benjamin and of Abner's men, so that 303 score men died. So a huge lopsided victory for the house of David. But yet they lost one of their top guys. They lost one of their elite uh, warriors. Verse 31. I'm sorry, verse 32. And they took up Azahel and buried him in the sepulcher of his father which was in Bethlehem and Joab and his men went all night and they came to Hebron at break of day. And so that's where we will stop for today and we will pick it up next week in chapter number three. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, for uh, again, just bringing these great truths to our eyes. Lord, I just pray that you would help us to remember the applications that we learned tonight and apply them to our lives. Lord, pray you bless the fellowship and the food after the service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.